All right, it's time for Mr. Asarata's ReZero, Season 3, Episode 3, Cut Content and Analysis. Let's get it. With last week ending off on regulars showing up, we were bound to get something of interest. And in terms of narrative content, this might be my favorite episode so far. Okay. Stay tuned because there might be something more about regulars than you might have noticed. Oh. We pick up immediately where we left off as regulars holds Amelia in his arms. The narration in this part of the novel pretty much roasts him, saying he leaves a middling impression, a man of medium height, a medium build, and unnoteworthy looks. Rezero. How? How, how, why is the artist going against everything the author states about this character? What the fuck is he doing? Basically said he has no aura. Regulus begins to start yapping and Subaru makes the biggest mistake one can make when dealing with this guy. He interrupts his train of thought. Uh -oh. This causes Regulus to fly off the handle and begin to talk about courtesy. He mentions exchanging names and how rude it is that Subaru has yet to do so, which immediately made me think of what I had spoken about in the episode 1 video, with Garf not giving up his name to the kids. Giving up your name or exchanging names or is tiger. such a courtesy in this world that even the Sin Archbishops will engage in it. A but you shouldn't exchange your name against Gluttony, because it's seemingly like, if that's the case, then that's how your name gets eaten away. What? Regulus begins to primarily yap about his own rights and autonomy. As he complains about his rights, Sirius lashes out at him. There were signs of it before, but this is proof in itself that the Archbishops don't really have any sense of cohesion. That's they right, but it's crazy. They all beef and banter. They do not get along, but they're united under a single goal, through the Gospel, and probably through Pandora. Archer, Bog, Standard, Terrorist Group, all having their own goals unified by a potential single cause. This causes Sirius and Regulus to start arguing, as she is not amused by his presence here and him saving Amelia. Regulus' dialogue really highlights how he doesn't really see people as people, but as property or commodities. Their assets to him. On shortly, but I just wanted to pop that in. Everything is just objects to him. Amelia is an object to desire, everyone else is just NPCs. The only important person is Regulus. Man, imagine if Regulus was the Isakai main character. To your mind for the future. While they undergo their exchange, Subaru is too afraid to even move until Betty calls his name. This was a particularly sweet moment in the novel as well, the narration stating, his precious partner gave him the courage to defy his fear, to wow. stand and face the twin natural disasters. This is something that I particularly love about the ED for this core, with the ending of it showing everyone pushing Subaru to keep going. Yeah, especially Reinhardt that literally picks up Subaru by like the collar of the neck. That was so funny to me. And this is going to be an underlying theme throughout this arc. Whatever the Subaru- Great, everyone's gonna help. Everyone's gonna help out. Unless these phased out hands mean everyone's dead here. <laughs> and only Reinhardt's alive. No, 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 that's not what's happening. Theme throughout this arc. Whenever the Subaru of old would waver or crumble under the pressure of doing it all by himself, there will be people and connections we got a team. to pick him back up. That's right. Arc 5 is really just a fantastic payoff for Arc 4. Subaru reassures Luzbo that he will save Tina before charging in, whipping Regulus by the neck, and having Betty drop a Shamok on Regulus. He clears the Shamok with ease, it being completely ineffective, and as Subaru senses impending death, the duo unleashes one of the three new spells. EMM. EMM. Emilia Tan Mega... I don't know, fucking, it's, it's more of those EMT fucking cringe jokes. Regulus can't actually touch Subaru, the spell acting as a magic field that cuts a being off from the world, protecting Subaru from one hit. Invincibility. There is a small cut here that makes Subaru lose- He literally has iframes. There was also a mention in the subs about how you're like half a step ahead. I thought that had to do with like how you're literally moving future-like, but... Is that what's actually happening here? Or is EMM basically just super armor? Just invincibility frames for one attack? Use even more aura points, but that's alright. As then, he would unleash invisible providence. The blowback comes quickly as he falls to his knees once again. The narration described the feeling of using invisible providence as a corruption of his soul. Something we can- Corruption of his soul? Really? And is that what Sirius is saying when Sirius said that Betrigis will come back? No, not now, but like, you will be better used later. If his soul gets corrupted, the more he uses the authority, is that how better could return? I don't know. Can put a pin in for now. Regulus continues to yap, talking about being due a wife that he could cherish, and this is when I would like to draw extreme parallels between Subaru and Regulus, because I find these two to be quite an interesting pro-tag and antag foil. 
the Subaru from arcs 1 and 4 is a much different person than the one we're seeing now. Mm. This is why I think Regulus is his prime antagonist for the arc, and also why I He's basically fighting his past self. If he never corrected his behaviors and had OP powers, that's what Regulus would be. And Subaru is supposed to defy that and show that he has grown and you don't have to be like that. I believe that arc 5 serves as a fantastic benchmark arc for him. It shows us how far he's come. You see, Regulus is a far more corrupted and twisted version of the Subaru that once was. Arc 1 through 3 Subaru had massive issues of understanding and respecting people's autonomy. He would call people NPCs, in mm -hmm. his mind they were quest givers that followed lines of code, and in Arc 3 he would continually break through Amelia's boundaries for his own self-serving attitude, exploding at her about how she had a greater debt to him than she could ever repay, talking about Legendary line. Owed. Which was especially fitting that Petal Juice was his antagonist for Arc 3 because he also mirrored a lot of that obsessive love and, and obligation that Subaru felt. And now with that in mind, think about the things that Regulus was saying about Amelia. Ab just the looks, right? Again, just Regulus is basically Subaru. If he never changed and had OP powers, why does he even like Amelia? Initially, it was just for the looks. About how he's do a wife. There is a clear and direct parallel to the Subaru of old, including Arc 4 Subaru, who would break down while battling with Roswell as he realizes that he was second to Roswell in underestimating her, in not respecting her wishes, and thinking that he can just do everything for her. Regulus also goes on to comment about how strong women are so difficult to deal with, about how he doesn't even know Amelia's name, and the only thing he likes about her is her face. Yeah. This is completely in line with Subaru's behavior of old. Subaru was lashing out and thinking he could do better than all of these women that are drastically stronger than him. He chased after Amelia endlessly in Arc 1 despite not knowing her name. There was even the Priscilla moment, right? Where he's like, you know, Priscilla, you need my help? Like, no, she did not need your help. And all he was attracted to was how she looked. Perhaps a video on how Subaru and Regulus foil each other later in this arc. Okay. For all these reasons and more, like how Subaru debuts EMM, only to find out that Regulus has a 24-7 EMM, Subaru and Regulus are really interesting foils for each other and make a super interesting twisted relationship, as Subaru faces what he could have been had he gone down a much darker path in this world, telling Regulus to just die, as him and Betty leap towards him to unleash their second spell, but before they can, Sirius reminds us that she's still here. She begins to ramble about how she has found him, and due to the use of invisible providence, Sirius has become convinced that Petal Juice lies within Subaru. I wonder how she could tell though, even though she couldn't see the hand. Invisible providence happened, but she can't see the hand. But she can kind of sense the sloth witch factor, maybe? Maybe you can distinguish sloths from different sins? As if he is one of the fingers, and she has found her husband. Regulus and Sirius argue about each other's relative insanity, and Sirius begins to describe a completely one-sided relationship, and I almost can't help but draw some parallels to the way Sirius acts, and the way Rem was acting before she got got. Rem was acting before she got got. Sirius and Rem. Rem was also very flawed in Season 1. A lot of people never criticize Rem because she's a waifu, but like, Betrigus was calling Rem out for everything that she was doing wrong too. Rem's love for Subaru wasn't as one-sided, but she did take things to an extreme, being mad about people even smelling Subaru. Sirius yelling how she won't hold back is what really made me think of this connection. The clock strikes noon, and Regulus announces that he has nothing left to do here anymore. Subaru tries to stop him, but Regulus kicks the top Ooh. of a rock and completely blows Subaru's leg off. Of course, due to Sirius's soul washing, the entire crowd suffers the same wound as the consciousness fade from Subaru's eyes. Betty tries her best to save him, tears rolling down her cheeks, and assumedly, Subaru dies. And the mana's all gone, and again, it's the bell rings in both Sirius and Regulus leave. They're just so, just attentive to the time. The gospel has told them when it hits noon, it's like phase two of the operation. Everyone is just listening so intently. It's her best to save him, tears rolling down her cheeks, and assumedly, Subaru dies. But then he wakes up. Al. Before we get into our next scenes, though, I want to touch on a couple of things. First, cut content for Al, saying that you should never give your name to Gluttony. Just what exactly is Regulus' authority? If you um, <laughs> it, it's really just feeling like vector transformation. <laughs> I, I don't know. Just bringing some accelerated shit from Index. It's looking like, what did he do with the rock? Well, he touched it. He didn't necessarily kick it. He basically tapped it in the top. Then it went just so fucking fast like a bullet. What has he done before? Um, he has this like invisible armor. Uh, I feel like, but it's gotta be something that he has to be conscious of. It's not on 24 seven. You've seen time after time where Regulus gets hit by, let's say the rope or invisible providence or Betrigus's hands the first time. If he's not aware of it, he can't be hurt. 
but maybe he also has like full uh control over let's say like the space in front of him like the wind particles does that even fucking make sense to make this like mugen like infinite like fucking barrier he also throws sands up in the air right and then he changes the sands into these like a needle like uh forms and just like obliterates pandora more of shit where you're controlling you know substances at an atomic level i don't know exactly how the fuck he doesn't take damage though i'm not talking about the barrier the invisible barrier but uh, but i'm talking about when his neck got twisted in season two in the trial dude that shit like returned i don't know how to fucking explain that with the authority but it's seemingly more and more unclear that it seems like vector transformation or some sort of variant. If you have any theories, please leave them in the comments below. Second, there was a pervading question from the last episode about Sirius and Reinhardt. Why doesn't Reinhardt just take the unconscious Sirius and take her away? Mm. Firstly, there was some cut dialogue about Reinhardt also being affected by her authority. It's unsure if he was being real or if he was just you know, downplaying himself per usual, but there is a chance that Reinhardt would eventually lose himself to Sirius' saw washing. Second, okay. There is nothing indicating that Ceres being dragged away turns off our authority. In the light novel... Yeah, who knows exactly how it's the range is working. Um, I was thinking there was some range because, like, you know, Reinhardt was kicking Sirius and taking a lot of physical damage, but the people in the town square in the anime, it didn't look like they are being damaged. But actually, in the cut content, people were getting bruised. So it's looking like the range is a non-factor. It's described as an ability that affects the very soul. It's not as simple as magic, hence why Betty said Shamak wouldn't work. The LN also describes the power as being effective as long as you know Sirius exists. That's right. It's not about like... Uh, well, I, I feel... It, it's about like acknowledging her existence in your soul. It's, if you look away, if you cover your ears, it doesn't matter. If you're thinking about her, if you're aware, if you acknowledge that she exists, that's when you're just God. So there is nothing implying that dragging her away would solve it. Of course, these things should have been more clear in the anime. There's also only so much time to communicate the plan with Reinhardt as Super has to get to the square, convince Ratchins to fire the flare, wait for Reinhardt to get there, and then tell him the information before he gets- I feel like we're just overlooking such an important person that could undo the authority. And it has to be Liliana. I'm sure Liliana's songs can basically just like make people forget, you know, Sirius' existence or something about that. But maybe it's not time yet, right? Maybe they're saving that for like a moment later on. Plus, you know, it's a bit too late. A new checkpoint is most likely made, so I don't think we're going to be able to redo this fight with Sirius now. Soul washed. Uh, and usually by the time Reinhardt gets there, he is soul washed. We also don't know how much Subaru can tell Reinhardt before the return by death taboo activates. Remember, it's not a science on how it activates. It's based on the fickle whims of one girl. Subaru's current character is in a state of not using his life as a tool to gamble. Rather Good. than throwing away his life to experiment with minor tuning, he would rather do what he thinks has the best option of working and securing lives in this very moment. Yeah, and that was such a big lesson to be learned in Season 2, where it's just like, you're not supposed to use this to save everyone. You're supposed to use it to save yourself. Why can't you realize that? And experimenting with Sirius' authority's distance is probably not the best option for him. Last video, I spoke about the meaning of the name. No, I, I think that Shamak's talk about the authority, that's not what's happening. Because if Shamak was used before anyone acknowledged Sirius, I do believe that it would help. Because they can no longer acknowledge Sirius. They're in this debuff state where the senses are all gone. But if they were already affected by the authority, then at that point, Shamak wouldn't do anything. Name Sirius, well, Regulus is no exception. Regulus is the brightest star in the constellation Leo, rising at about 3 a.m. at the time of recording. Regulus okay. has a couple of meanings. Little King in Latin. <laughs> little King? Uh, when I think Little King, I'm thinking of like short man syndrome, people that are very insecure and feel the need to have all these different big trucks, perhaps many wives to, you know, justify their existence. And Heart of the Lion in Arabic. Heart of the Lion? That sounds too cool for Regulus. Heart of a lion? That's some like pride shit like Kyoya. Tategami Kyoya. <laughs> From Beyblade Metal Saga. Anyways, Regulus is a little king but also has a heart of a lion. It serves as the beating heart of its own constellation. In Greek mythology, Leo the lion would capture women and take them into its cave. Killing oh my the god. that came to save the damsels in distress. The lore. The lion is taking the women, many wives. A fitting direction considering he has now captured Amelia. We finally get to see what Otto's up to, and uh, he's enjoying his time at a sweet shop. Sorry. As, you know, Super gets his leg blown off. Man, they mention Sori, the pastry, so many times. I'm like, bro, I want to eat one. Shop, 
as you know, Super gets his leg blown off, and overhears the city guard telling someone that this is no place to be playing. We quickly realize that this is no ordinary child. Lie. As Lei Bot and Kaitos grabs the guard's skull and smashes it. If Greed and Wrath weren't enough, Gluttony makes its debut in front of the not so powerful Otto. And the other thing to make note of is how Lai responded when being talked to. He spoke in plural. He did not say I. He said we and us. It's I don't think ReZero, I don't think this is a sub mistake. I think ReZero is very, you know, intentional with their wording, and this may be a little subtle cue that the Archbishop of Gluttony, is it truly just Lai Baitenkaitos? At this point, the theories are kind of going crazy. Novel readers or people who watch my cut content videos, however, may know that he isn't as defenseless as he seems. We see what Garf and Mimi have been up to as the Sin Archbishops slowly spread throughout the city. Garf's mom knew exactly what tea leaves he liked for some reason, and he just couldn't believe it. Subconscious. He wants to leave, but Mimi and the boy don't want him to, as Garfield's body feels like it's being torn asunder, seeing his mom act like nothing has happened. He tries to swiftly leave again, but then the father of the household returns. A tiger was strong, nothing ever shook a tiger, so what part of Garf was a tiger? He drags Mimi out of the house as more images of Elsa bombard his mind. He's not really a gorgeous tiger right now, he's just fucking emo tiger. Mind. The man rushes after them, and we don't learn his name in the anime, so cut content it is. Garf confronts him, asking if Lyra is her real name, and we learn that he found her with no memories 15 years ago. Given this happens immediately after we see Gluttony enter the scene, I think there's a very clear connection to be drawn here. It's very possible that Garf- We're gonna- I don't know, like, like- <sighs> It's 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 looking like the landslide did it right. Landslide happened. She's knocked out. You tell me, Lai was just there, ready? I think that Lai may have eaten the name. It's it's looking like there's definitely a connection. And whenever we're talking about memories, Gluttony definitely comes into play. So if we defeat Lai, if we defeat Gluttony, then there's potential not just for Rem to return, but for Garfield's mom to return. Assuming that that's what how that works. But yeah, also the timeline doesn't work because 13 years old. But there's an implication of we, meaning multiple gluttonies. And even if the multiple gluttonies timeline doesn't work, there is still a chance that the previous user of the authority of gluttony may have done it. But we do not authorities change with each different user. At that point, we can now blame the white whale and Pandora. Easy. Garf's mom is a victim of gluttony. Despite it all, Garf would tell him that he has no relationship with his wife. And at that moment, the torrent in his chest faded, and he was left instead with a cavernous loss. Garf did not want to cause a divide in the family life for his own personal satisfaction. Who would he be to just show up and put that on them? There's almost something to be said about how Garf is like a pseudo-gluttony victim right now, refusing to mm. give up his own name, offering an alias instead. Gorgeous and tiger. That defined so much of his existence are back to haunt him, yet nobody knows the truth. I wonder if they're setting up the fight to be between Garfield and Gluttony then? I don't know. Welcome to the outside world, Garfield Tinsel. After also, it would be children fighting against each other. It'd be a 14-year-old fighting a 15-year-old, so I wouldn't feel bad. Crying his heart out and wondering what he looks like right now, the sun rises and Garf and Mimi eat the sweets from his mom. But not everything is as it appears. Capella. As the broadcast from Capella begins. Before we get into that, however, we cut back to what Subaru is up to in the field hospital, alongside Alan Ferris. The room is full of injured people, and as a result, Betty is in a deep sleep, having used the last of her mana to save everyone, powering down to present Another way that Nagatsuki Tape nerfs and balances the OP powers surrounding Subaru, right? Like, you would think that we could just Minya and Al Shimak our way out of this? Hell no. Betty gone. Who knows when Betty's gonna return? Well, she needs mana. She needs mana. Uh, we need a mana battery. Uh, there's these like mana crystals that exist in town, but other than that, I wonder how we're gonna get Betty back. Reserve what is left. In the novels, this is when Subaru begins to pressure himself. His first thoughts being one of reverting to his previous states, and Ferris stops him. It doesn't always have to be zero to 100 with him. Subaru is someone who has always struggled with the concept of relying on others, always wanting to go it alone, and this small scene displays one of my favorite aspects of ReZero, which is the depiction of mental health and relapse. Mental health and relapse. A nice way where Subaru can repeat his mistakes and it's still realistic and makes sense. What do you expect him to just always figure it out and, you know... I, I think that, like, a lot of people say, like, he has no development because he keeps repeating his mistakes. But it kind of does make sense at this point how he would be acting like that after a year, uh, uh, after a year of just, like, peace. Plus the whole relapse factor. 
it would be easy for the story to just have Subaru be fixed and keep going, but it keeps referencing his old behavior and how it requires a conscious effort to change it. We yeah, and maybe that's better than having this perfect person that just now never does shit by- I, it, it would get boring. Would it get boring? Him constantly struggling and trying to- for us to re like figure out how he's gonna solve this is fun. If he figures shit out and just like- I, I, I think that um- it's not as if he did it alone here though, right? Because Felix like corrected him and he had the awareness and the presence of mind was like, yep, let's let's not do that shit that we've been doing in the past and let's, you know, work with others. We see this reflected in how Subaru immediately tries to solve Sirius on his own. Yeah, and look how that way, went. My comment said that this was stupid and yeah, it was. Yes, there has never been a time where Subaru does something by himself and it worked out. It usually never works out. If not always never works out. What did Subaru do by himself, where he was rewarded for it. Usually, it's just like super failures, right? He learns that like, shit, I cannot do this by myself. I need to like, gather powerful allies. The point being, he needs to rely on the people that love him. There is one cut here, but it's not that big of a deal. And we'll just touch on it in the cut content section, because why not? We cut to the Witch Cult Disaster Response HQ, stowed away inside of the Muse Company building, because Kiritaka is one of the Council of Ten, one of the most powerful people in the city. Pristella Ten. Anastasia informs Subaru why they are located here. The four control towers of Pristella have been seized by the Witch Cult, and the city can be submerged at any moment. Yeah, we're gonna get drowned. The made their demands clear over the announcement meteor. What they are looking for are the Witch's bones. This city was used to drown a witch, but no more details are known beyond that. T-Phone! Bro, I can't believe motherfuckers got upset that I pronounce t phone's name t phone rather than Typhon. Motherfucker, are you listening to the Japanese pronunciation of the word? That's the only thing that I give a fuck about. Everyone calls her t phone. I'm gonna call her t phone. And only the Council of Ten would know. The person speaking over the radio was none other than the Saint Archbishop of Lust, Capella Emirata Lagunica. Lagunica. Finally, the episode cuts back. Mention Lagunica last name! How is this possible? Dr. Garfield. As his mom runs out in a panic, looking for her children who went to go out and play, asking if he can help. He swallows his prior feelings and tells his mother he will do what he can to save them all. This episode introduced a lot of cool elements, more about Regulus and his power, great characterization for a lot of our cast, and the great mystery of the witch's bones. If you have any theories about why they are here for the... Uh, well, t got drowned out, right? We know the cut content of how the different witches actually died. Now, Echidna... I wonder, she, it was told that Satala consumed them, right? But I think that's still possible. I mean, now we're getting more details of how the different witches died. And Tifone got drowned here. The remains are the bones. What do you do with the bones? Well, let's think about it. Who is probably organizing all this? Pandora? What did Pandora want? I'm not sure. But she wants to release the seal in Elior Forest. She needs a key. Amelia is a key. But... Maybe that's not her only goal. Does the bone somehow help her with the, with the seal? Does the bones... Is it a material for making something? It's also interesting how the current position of the Archbishop of Pride is empty. It's not as if this position was always missing, but... Because, like, people may think that, like, uh, well... Has an Archbishop and a Witch existed at the same time? You could assume that with Omega, right? Because, like, Echidna is now out with o in, as Omega and, you know, Regulus exists. But I'm just trying to, like, think about, like, how does this make sense? Pride position is empty. The bones are important for something. Is the bones important materials to create an item? Is it a catalyst for some sort of ritual? Is the goal to resurrect T-Phone? But how, what would that even make sense? Why would they want to do that? Plus, Tifone's soul is, you know, in Omega's, like, crystal, along with the other witches. So I don't think it's the resurrection of Tifone. But what about the witch factor of pride? Where is that right now? I don't fucking know. We, uh, presumably, it's not bound to the bone. Presumably, it's... Maybe there's a different person that already has it. I don't know. Maybe it's in a box somewhere else. Because it's also mentioned that even if the Archbishop of Pride position is empty right now, that position was occupied. Uh, in, in the past, probably not pre-Calamity days, but after the Calamity. So, I don't know. Maybe the bones have the witch factor. Maybe the bones are important materials to create something. Is it another key for their seal? I don't fucking know. Remains, please leave them in the comments. Overall, 
a good episode that feathers the brakes a little bit to start putting together some building blocks for the oncoming conflict. Or, or, the biggest troll of it all. We are right now fixated and tunnel visioning on the goal actually being the bones. This show is a bullshit show where everything is a guess's implication assumptions and the author also lies. What if the bones is actually not the important thing? <laughs> Why not? Why not? Think about that, right? Why? Why not? Fuck it, dude. Like, uh, <laughs> the bones don't matter. Pandora is using this as an excuse for something else. Why not? This week, in terms of cut content, we're not actually dealing with much. Uh, the episode has a lot of rearrangements, so it's possible that things were cut, but we won't really know for sure until episode 4. What I can say is that there is a bit of- I'm about to put you on trial. See, the anime never mentioned that what was in the box was Flugel's remains. We're told by Betrigus that Flugel entrusted him with the Sloth Witch Factor. If the cut content, if you can source me the cut content where it tells us that it was Flugel's remains, he says in the anime, when? When? Nah, bro. He said that Flugel trusted Betrigus with the fucking box that had the witch factor in it. Now, if there's cut content, that's fair game, right? If it's cut content, that's fair game. But I fear that we have an overzealous and enthusiastic ReZero Light Null Reader. It's stated in a Q&A, not the novel. Which Q&A is it? <laughs> Q&A during which arc? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's basically what I remember is uh, he entrusted him with that witch factor. And uh, flew, uh, I think uh, he also mentioned a specific line about how like, even if he is not like worthy or not like have the knowledge or some shit, th there's an extra line that he mentioned. Now that I, you're not a reader. Are you feigning ignorance right now? Or, or are you saying I'm a retard and you, I, I, I just brought up a random fact? So you're not a light novel reader. And you said, you basically, but hold up. It's stated in a Q&A. No, 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 you can't do that. You can't just give us such an accurate, specific description of what the fuck was in the box and how it was attached to the remains of Flugel. And then someone else says, no, it was stated in a Q&A. So you're telling me that you, as an anime only, guessed this very specific example but now I'm supposed to believe that this is random now I'm supposed to believe that you're just making shit up and it just happens to be the actual thing Tape stated in the Q&A doesn't that feel like you're backtracking? Just be careful. Just, just, just be careful, goddammit! I don't want this information. Alright, let's get back to it. ...of Krush content. In the novels, while Subaru, Ferris, and Al are talking in the field hospital, Krush comes in when she hears about Subaru being awake, and then we get some exposition about the takeover of the control towers. However, I think most of that was replaced later in the episode anyway, so not really that big of a deal. The rest were just minor cuts here and there. In the novels, Subaru actually gets to land a normal punch on Regulus's face before really? using Invisible Providence because the punch left him exposed for an attack. He would also shortly after begin to analyze Regulus's fighting style and notes that he is even worse at fighting than the Three Stooges. They also- Re Yeah, because Regulus doesn't need to be able to fight, you know? He is such a- what's it called? OP person with his authority? That there's no reason to be good at martial arts. There's no need to be aware. And often he gets just like fucked up, right? He he get caught he gets caught off guard. And plus the fact that it's not just as like OP guard. If he actually gets hit, his neck gets twisted, seemingly does no damage. So a guy like that, yeah, for sure they wouldn't give a fuck about being, you know, um like good at fighting, quote unquote, by themselves. Cut out Elsa being in the house with Garf and Mimi, but they then If there is just a way to like somehow cut away Regulus's authority and Subaru could have like a fight against Regulus man to man, fist to fist. Oh, that would be fucking amazing. But how does that work? How is it possible to just strip away one of their authority without killing them? Added new Elsa scenes immediately afterwards, so eh. 
The father of the household gives us his name in the novels, Garrett Thompson, but unless I missed it in this episode. <laughs> Garrett Thompson, guys. Very important name. Nah, this dude's fucking dead. <laughs> Isn't this dude like a guard for the towers that the Archbishop has already taken over? I'm pretty sure the dad dead. Just kind of skated past that, but it's also not that big of a deal. This isn't necessarily a cut, but a missed opportunity. If you're still somehow unaware, Al is also from Japan. In mm -hmm. the anime continuity, this is a massive elephant in the room that is being left. Why are they not hyping up Al? He also mentioned, right, that you should not give your name away to lie or gluttony, implying that, you know, if you actually give your name away, then the name will be erased. How do we know that? Well, it's just one example. Season 2, Episode 1. Cruz never gave her name away. Rem actually did. And Rem got name and memory cut. Cruz only memory. Unaddressed. I was hoping it would be placed back in this episode because in the novels, Al initially reveals to Subaru about his state of being isekai when Subaru asks about how he lost his arm. There was an extremely clear layup here with the brief conversation between Subaru- Yeah, how he lost his arm. Um, you may think this is spoilers, but this is web novel cut content, so I don't think it's really spoilers. Al used to be a gladiator back in the Volakian Empire, the nation to the south that borders Lagunica. And it's supposed to be presumed that during those gladiator fights, Al lost his arm. Brute Al, when Al says that Subaru almost ended up like him being down a limb, the reason the novel community keeps talking about this without getting into spoiler territory is that the clock is ticking. There will eventually come a point where reintroducing this becomes a hassle and loses out on a lot of good foreshadowing points. There's also another point where Al has episodic memory loss, but that's... Again, which cult translations, you know, web novel cut content, who knows if that's going to be actual canon material for the source material, which is the anime space stone, which is the light novel. We are going to slowly lose references and entire scenes if the anime keeps going the way it's going, and seemingly refusing to re-add Aldebaran, like the Rem scene I speak about in another video. If you would like- Like, it's, it's pretty shitty, like, when we were leaving Priscilla's mansion, there was some insane cut content there, which hints that, like, Al despises Rem and Ram. Rem also mentions a malice from, you know, Al, the back of his helmet, you can sense the witch's miasma. It's looking like Al is somehow associated with the witches. Maybe he has an authority himself. Maybe he's the fucking, uh, the, uh, fuck it. Why not? He has the authority of pride, but if the theory right now is supposed to be that, you know, the remains of Tifon is where the authority of where the witch factor could be, then maybe that doesn't make sense. But it, it just sucks that there's so much amazing cut content that just sets up Al to be this insane character in the future arcs. And the anime, if they foreshadowed it, people will be glazing this anime saying this is the pinnacle of writing. I can't believe they fucking set up this character as early as season one and now we're going to pay off. But they're just doing nothing with that shit. And another thing that's pissing me off is Wilhelm. Wilhelm? <laughs> Blessing of the Grim Reaper. The open wound, when the person that inflicted him with the wound is nearby, Teresa von Austria. What the fuck? What the hell? You just noticed the neck? What the fuck? I, I, weren't you watching my reaction? When I said, is Al a, perhaps a ground dragon? Basically, I saw that Al is hiding his face and I saw his neck like this. And the neck kind of the rings reminded me of like a ground dragon outside. But it's not that, right? Al is just very disfigured in the face and maybe this is extra bandages. Who knows what these are, though? to know just how serious this is getting, make sure you check out my other cut content videos, yes, where in sir. one of them I speak at length about what was removed from Al's character. Uh, this episode actually added content with the auto scene being later in this arc, but mostly off screen, and as well as the prior mentioned Elsa scenes, so pretty good episode in terms of cut content, not much mm. to complain about. All right. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe for more. You can also check the description. Yes, sir. Uh, please go give Mr. Asarantha a like on the video. Here's his channel, man. And I will see you next time.